On today's episode of Biblical Genetics, we're going to ask the question, is Africa actually the cradle of humanity? We have been told for decades that humans evolved in Africa a few hundred thousand years ago, that there is no biblical Eve, that there is no biblical Adam, etc., etc. Is this true? Well, interestingly, cracks are starting to appear in the evolutionary edifice, and we've had a lot of things changing over the last specifically year or two. I mean, fossils being found outside of Africa at the wrong time frame, a, a footprint in Crete or a skull in Morocco or teeth in Iran. And all of a sudden people are like, you know, these things look awfully modern and they're kind of young and it's not supposed to be here because we weren't supposed to be a species yet. And then we have genetics and genetics has turned everything upside down because we're finding out that, well, we made it with Neanderthal, which I consider fully human. Look at a previous episode of Biblical Genetics for that, and I'm sure some more in the future also. But Neanderthals are human, the Denisophans, another uh, mysterious race of people that we only have their DNA and hardly any bones for. They're also human. And we have this inbreeding between what they thought were evolutionary disparate groups, and yet genes from those groups are in modern humans. They raise the question, what's a species? Where did we arise? And all sorts of things like that. But after all that, a brand new paper just appeared in Nature, the world's premier science journal, written by some very famous evolutionists called Origins of Modern Human Ancestry. This is picked up by several popular level sites like ScienceDaily.com and the British National History Museum, and they're quoting from this paper as if this new brand new revelation, and yet this revelation changes everything we've been taught for a long time, specifically that Africa has to be the origin point for humanity. Now, the original article is behind a paywall, but at least a popular level summary is there for anyone to read. And this raises some very interesting questions because clearly they're struggling with the old concept of the origin of humanity. And yet, if they can't pin it to a specific time and place, one wonders how much leeway they would allow. Now, of course, they're not going to allow the young Earth position, but all of a sudden, I mean, what if modern humanity arose outside of Africa? What if we arose in China or Europe or India? What if the, the key anatomical and brain differences between humans and chimpanzees was not an African innovation, but came from somewhere else? Maybe Africa was the first time that these things came together into a human being, what we would call a human being, fine, but all of a sudden, maybe we're not African anymore. Oh, very, very, very interesting. So here's a fair question. Why is it that for pretty much the last two centuries, evolutionists have taught us that we evolved from monkeys in Africa? Well, there's several reasons for that. And to put a modern spin on it, we understand now that there's more diversity in Africa and the human population than the rest of humanity put together. There's more differences between two people in Africa than, than might exist between maybe a European and some uh, native Australian Aborigine. There's a lot of diversity in Africa, a huge amount. Plus, the diversity is in smaller little bits, as if it's an older population, and that might have had more recombination because they're older, and there's all these arguments like that. Plus, monkeys live there. Plus, I wonder if there's still some latent strains of European racism involved in this question, because, I mean, you can't escape the fact that most of the paleoanthropologists in history were European, at least prior to World War II. The things that they said about Africans were horribly racist. I mean, unjustifiably in the modern times, and yet that is the underpinnings and the backbone behind a lot of evolutionary speculations. And I wonder if maybe finally, finally, they're starting to jettison some of that baggage. But once they do that, they realize that maybe we can't pin the origin of our species to one specific place in an old earth sort of a long-term model. How might we explain Africa from a young Earth perspective? Assuming Adam and Eve are true, Noah's flood is true, the Tower of Babel is true, and Africa is populated after Babel. How do we get all that diversity just within Africa? Well, there are several possible mechanisms. First is something I call patriarchal drive, which I described in an earlier biblical genetics episode. It's the idea that really old people, as in the biblical patriarchs, for several centuries after the flood, having children very late in life are going to produce children with a lot of mutations because men specifically, their reproductive cells start dividing at puberty and they don't stop dividing until they die. And, you know, within reason, a man can pretty much have children up to the day he dies. 
which means that older men with a high status in society, etc., etc., are kind of likely to have children late in life, and therefore we could be introducing lineages of humanity with very long branch lengths right at the beginning. So maybe some of those lineages got to Africa. Or the lineages that are most different in Africa are the most rarest people in Africa. And it looks like maybe they've had a lot of inbreeding over many, 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 many years. So something like the Khoisan, we call them Bushmen. I'm not exactly certain what the politically correct term is anymore. I'll call them the Khoisan. If you ever seen the movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy, or one of the spin-offs, those people, they live in Namibia and Southwest Africa. They have some of the oldest branches, oldest as in longest branches of the Y chromosome and mitochondrial family tree. Now, is that because they're really that old or because they had a lot of inbreeding or because they had a higher mutation rate or maybe they were founded by a later branch of one of the biblical patriarchs? I don't know, but those are all possibilities. There's also a possibility of higher mutation rates because anytime you have a small population, if one of those people has maybe a defective DNA repair enzyme, well, those mutations will propagate through the population faster. Or maybe there was a selective sweep across Eurasia where most of the older lineages were wiped out. And some of the older lineages in Africa survived. That might explain why we don't have Neanderthal Y chromosomes or Neanderthal mitochondria in the European population, even though we do know that Neanderthals and Euro early Europeans interbred because we have other pieces of, of Neanderthal DNA there. Or maybe Africa had a higher initial population size. Maybe the rest of the world was founded by very small groups and multiple groups got into Africa, specifically south of the Sahara Desert. Because when you're north of the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean peoples are very much homogenous compared to the gulf between the Mediterranean portions of Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. That's where the big difference is. We're really talking about Sub-Saharan Africans being very different, not Northern Africans, because there's been so much interchange culturally, wars, invasions, uh, you know, people doing what people do, that Northern Africa is much more European and Asian in its genetics than Southern Africa. But what if Southern Africa was simply founded by more people? Maybe more descendants of Noah got there, bringing more genetic diversity there to start the population off. Or what if they have a higher recombination rate? You see, the amount of scrambling between chromosomes directly affects how much diversity a population can handle. If you have more scrambling per generation, that population can harbor more genetic diversity. A study was performed several years ago where they looked at recombination rates in African Americans and European Americans, and they concluded that the recombination rate in African Americans was higher. That means there's more scrambling per generation of their genetic data, which means that that population can harbor more genetic diversity over longer periods of time. If that's true across Africa in general, and there is a gene that controls this called PRDM9, and Africans appear to have more PRDM9 sites than Europeans. Well, if that's true. Maybe there really is more recombination in Africa, or maybe even historically there might have been more recombination in Africans. Maybe it has slowed down because anytime a PRDM9 site mutates, there's one less place where recombination can happen. So maybe recombination rates are higher in the past. That might explain the data right there. We also have to account for post Babel migration into Africa after Africa was established as a continent, after people got there. The largest group of men in Africa belong to a branch of the E lineage of Y chromosomes. Now the longest branches are the A lineages. Those are in the Khoisan, but 95% of African men, Southern African men, I should say, have this E haplotype, the E group, but their branches branch off from non-Africans and those branches branch off from non-Africans, which branch off from non-Africans. So it appears that this group arose outside of Africa and then invaded and almost took over to the point where almost all African men are descended from those people. Well, that's a post Babel invasion event right there. Now, interestingly, my Y chromosome, which is R1B, is strongly associated with people of Western European extraction, like 80% of Western Europeans. And my, my little subgroup of R1B is associated with Northern Ireland, where my Irish great-great-whatever-grandfather came from. But there's a group of men who live in Cameroon, south of Lake Chad, in the dead center of the continent, who have my Y chromosome. 
So somehow a group of my ancestors split off and went to the center of Africa. And today those men have some of the darkest skin of any people on the planet. And yet they're my cousins. In fact, I'm more closely related to them than I might be to other Irish men who are from different parts of the family tree. Yeah, so that asks the question of what is a race, but that's a whole nother story. And I've talked about that several times. I'm sure we'll get back to it again later. So putting all that together, this latest paper says you cannot pin the origin of humanity to a specific place or a specific time. Wow, what an admission. Let me read you a quote. Reporting in ScienceDaily.com, Pontus Scoglin, one of the co-authors, says, Contrary to what many believe, neither the genetic or fossil record have so far revealed a defined time and place for the origin of our species. Such a point in time, when the majority of our ancestry was found in a small geographic region and the traits we associate with our species appeared, may not have existed. For now, it would be useful to move away from the idea of a single time and place of origin. So here are some very well-known evolutionists saying, we have to jettison the outdated, old-fashioned, moribund idea that we evolved in a small population in Africa. In fact, now anything is on the table. So I know that there's some Chinese scientists who are trying to argue that China is the source of modern humanity. And I bet maybe some people in India want to make that claim. I know Europeans have tried to make that claim in the past, and happily this have fallen by the wayside because they were wrong. But what about biblically? Because not far outside of Africa is a location where people lived right after the flood and the site of the Tower of Babel. In fact, the genetic diversity in the Middle East is very high. Africa might be a little higher, but Northeast Africa is the highest diversity area of Africa. One reason for that is because only 10 miles separates Africa from the Arabian Peninsula uh, near Djibouti. And that's been a historic trade route, an historic uh, migration route, and a place to exchange slaves. There's uh, invading armies. There's been a lot of, let's say, a genetic exchange between Africa and Asia at that location. And plus, you have the Nile River Valley, you have the coastland going all the way down uh, towards southern Africa. You can get to Africa from other places, and a lot of people have in the past, and there's been a lot of genetic exchange, but Northeast Africa is a center of diversity. And diversity goes down as you go westward in Africa and southward in Africa. The Middle East has a very high genetic diversity level. Maybe that's the origin of humanity. Of course, that's not allowed. No, that would never be allowed because it sounds too biblical. But you can no longer exclude that from first principles, especially according to what these scientists are saying. Let me read you another quote. This is from the abstract. We argue that no specific point in time can currently be identified at which modern human ancestry was confined to a limited birthplace. And that patterns of the first appearance of anatomical or behavioral traits that are used to define Homo sapiens are consistent with a range of evolutionary histories. These scientists are hinting at an idea that's always been the minority view. Even when the out of Africa theory was reigning supreme, there's always been some people who thought that we evolved in a large pan mictic population over a large geographic area. It's called multi regionalism. The idea that genes are popping up here and there over a large space and they're floating around the population over a long time and selection was operating and random combinations are leading to the slow and gradual and better development of what we call human uh, homo sapiens okay but tacitly they're saying that the numbers don't tell us where we came from therefore we cannot exclude necessarily the idea that we came out of the middle east but if we came out of the middle east what if we came out of the middle east recently what if we actually came from the Tower of Babel population? What if Africa was founded by a large group of people with a lot of genetic diversity? Or what if the people that got there were affected by patriarchal drive? Or what if the people that got there had more PRDM9 sites? We had more uh, ge genetic diversity maintained in the population over time. Or maybe wave after wave after wave of migration and invasion affected Africa. And so more and more genetics get into Africa over time. All these things are possible and all those things fit with the biblical picture. My friends, you don't have to run away from the Bible. Don't be cowed by evolutionary evo speak. Don't be afraid of the status quo. Don't be afraid to question. And it's really interesting when we see the scientists questioning the other scientists about evolutionary theories, especially when they help us with 
creation theory. Now at this point, you might want to go back and watch or rewatch my episode Patriarchal Drive in the Early Post-Flood Population. It's available on biblicalgenetics.com. There's also an article on creation.com about Patriarchal Drive. I published it in the Journal of Creation. It's now available for free on the website. You might also want to consider my earlier episode, Did Eve Live in Southern Africa? Just about one year ago, a paper came out claiming that they could pinpoint the location of Eve at a specific place in southernmost Africa. And I said this is absolutely not true, and this new information I just presented to you makes this claim even worse. But go look at that if you're interested. Before I go, I want to thank my brand new Patreon supporters, Dave H. and Rob S. Thank you so much. If you want to help out in that way, just go to patreon.com, find my site, Biblical Genetics, and you can join up also. I also want to give a hat tip to the people who have supported me on buymeacoffee.com. Mark C., Stephanie S., G.O.B., several anonymous people, and all of you who have impronounceable uh, code names. Thank you so much. You're helping to keep this show going, and I really, really appreciate it. That's all for now. Thank you for watching. Be encouraged, my friends, that there are answers to these things. Some of these answers are hard to come by, but with enough study and enough dedicated pursuit of truth, we can learn enough about science to back up the biblical claims of history.